Good morning, everyone. So uh, today is the uh, second uh, lecture on uh, Monte Carlo sampling. And uh, the uh, lecture uh, today is on a specific style of Monte Carlo sampling called Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling or MCMC. Okay, before I get into the details, let's talk about our motivation. Why are we doing all this? Uh, sampling is a very important technique for those uh, who are interested in this field of machine learning or deep learning. Uh, and why are they so important again? Is because we often take a bunch of data and we construct a probability distribution from the data. So we're just presenting these uh, data samples one after the other, whatever be the data set. Uh, quite often we are constructing a probability distribution that is all the weights in the network together define a distribution. Of course, sometimes in supervised learning, we don't care about the distribution. We're only interested in a discriminative model, which simply says what kind of a object it is and give, gives us a, a value as a decision. But a broader use of uh, machine learning and deep learning is to simply learn the distribution involving several levels of abstraction, right? That's what all the levels of, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the deep model are. So, so keeping that in mind, that what it is we have constructed is a distribution. And what are you gonna use that for? And some of it is for inference. It is, uh, I present some example, and one inference is, of course, uh, to give the class or something. Or it could be a probability distribution. We're interested in some variable, and what are the probabilities of all the values you can take? That could be the output, for example. Uh, some of it could be just that we want the samples themselves. We are not interested in samples from some inference point of view. We just need some samples. So we can use it for some purpose, like a speech or something like that. Or sometimes we want to see for a style program to see what are all the different possibilities that, that arises from this distribution. So there are many reasons why uh, we need sampling. Most of, often it's for inference. <coughs> so that's why uh, we, we need sampling. And what did we do last time? is uh, we talked about some uh, basic method called importance sampling. That is uh, because the model we have is quite complicated and uh, because it's represented by means of so many uh, variables, hidden variables, for instance, uh, we construct some uh, proposal distribution and then we uh, take samples from the proposal distribution, which is much simpler form. And we uh, weight the samples and use that for whatever uh, goal we have in mind. So today we go beyond that and say uh, there are many limitations to important sampling. One of which is that the proposal distribution itself is uh, hard to compose because the real distribution that we have constructed may be very complex. Like if it's about faces, there is going to be all kinds of peaks in this multidimensional distribution so getting a proposal that in any way matches that is going to be almost impossible. So that's only good when you have fairly simple distributions. Today's deep learning is uh, looking at very, very complex uh, distributions. So important sampling does not extend itself nicely. And which is where this idea of Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling comes into play. Of course, we already saw Gibbs distribution and that is a particular case of Markov chain Monte Carlo. So we want to take a look at this more closely. What is this Markov chain Monte Carlo? And then we'll again uh, go back and say, well, Gibbs is just a special case of it. And eventually we're going to be saying that uh, Gibbs is the most uh, widely used uh, uh, sampling method for uh, representing probability distribution in deep learning networks in the form of undirected models, right? Not directed in terms of uh, dependencies and so on. It's undirected model, which is a kind of a common, uh, common description of a, a neural network. 
So that's what we're going to be doing. We'll be describing Markov chain Monte Carlo. And uh, again, an overview of what is this Markov chain Monte Carlo. It says, uh, rather than work with a proposal distribution, like generating samples from a proposal, can't we work with a proposal distribution that keeps on changing? So it says, uh, well, you generate samples from some proposal distribution and then uh, we will be comparing it to the probability assigned by the proposal distribution, probability assigned by the model. By the model, we mean the neural network. Uh, and uh, if we find that it is getting into a very low probability zone, we kind of move, move the entire proposal distribution itself. So we're saying we can keep on changing the proposal distribution as we observe samples. So that is the idea of Markov chain Monte Carlo, that there is some kind of dependency between what we've observed. And if some of you may, may be familiar with Markov chains, and say Markov chains uh, are, uh, describe stochastic processes where probabilities change over time. So it's the same kind of idea here. So that is what uh, we'll uh, bring to play and how to construct such a sequence uh, for uh, uh, more complex models, all right? So that should set up the framework why we are studying it, okay? I mean, you have to, you have to ask yourself this question, what is the importance of setting up uh, sampling in deep learning? And, uh, and I'm arguing here that it's a very important concept for all of deep learning, so it's better to be aware of it. Of course, there is many techniques and maybe you don't need all of it, but it's nice to know uh, what it is that, that they're doing. So we, 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 uh, we will describe Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, and describe uh, what, is a, uh, what is a Markov chain. I mean, that is basic stuff on, on Markov chains, but how is it used in, uh, in sampling? And uh, after that, uh, we go to Gibbs sampling and uh, the actually I have three parts for today's lecture. I don't know how much we'll cover, but uh, if you're able to cover uh, the second part as Gibbs sampling, the third part is uh, what is called as the mode collapse problem. It's a famous problem for deep learning that uh, you are generating samples, but the samples are all coming from uh, a few modes. You know, mode means uh, a peak of the probability distribution. So it's generating the same kind of samples, which is not the intention of this sampling. We don't want the samples to all be kind of correlated with each other and coming from the same kind. For instance, if it is about human faces, we don't want all of them to be of the same uh, kind of face. Uh, we want it to sample uh, throughout the distribution. Of course, some of them may be high probability uh, modes, a big peak here, and others might be low probability. So it is natural that uh, in a true set of samples, the high modes will be highly represented and the low ones will not be highly represented. But we don't want it to be stuck, always preferring one, the majority population, for instance, right? So. Uh, so that is a, a famous problem called the mode collapse problem. And a lot of the research in deep learning has been how to avoid this. Today, we will simply describe what is that problem? Why does that happen? And that again relates to uh, the uh, idea of Markov chain sampling. All right. So with all that preamble, I am going to uh, now uh, share the PowerPoint for today's lecture. There are three parts again. I'll try to remember to do each of them. And, uh, okay, you, let me put it on slideshow. Okay, so uh, you should now have uh, my slide set come up. If not, please tell me. Uh, this says Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, right? It's visible to you. All right, so that is the uh, topic, which is uh, a midpoint in our study of, of Monte Carlo methods. Okay, and this is actually the table of contents of Monte Carlo methods. Uh, last uh, week, we studied sampling in Monte Carlo methods, what those are, 
and a particular method called importance sampling. So today we begin with Markov chain Monte Carlo methods and if time permits, we do uh, four and five Gibbs sampling and mixing between separated modes. So what are the topics within Markov chain Monte Carlo is, uh, first we want to talk about limitations of plain Monte Carlo, like independent sampling. So uh, a, a plain method, uh, you know, what is uh, missing in it? And then we define the idea of Markov chains about the dependency I spoke about. And these Markov uh, chain Monte Carlo, it's uh, abbreviated as MCMC, uh, prefers to have the probability distribution in the form of an energy-based model. If you recall, when we talked about probabilistic graphical models, we talked about how a uh, undirected model, that is no arrows in undirected model, can be represented by means of factors uh, over all of its uh, all of its cliques. So energy-based models is a slight change from that formulation by uh, doing a, a negative logarithm of the factors, uh, which causes the energy-based model to have a simple formulation. And that formulation uh, is the same as probability formulation, except it's upside down that a high energy uh, model uh, will have a low probability. That is, if you have uh, some settings for these, uh, for these factors that causes the energy to be high, which means the probability is low. So energy and probability have opposite connotations, inverse connotations, and that comes from physics, right? High energy is low probability and low energy is high probability. Same kind of thing here also. And why do we choose energy-based formulation for MCMC? Is that MCMC requires the states to not have zero probability. Because if you have a state with a zero probability, you will get stuck in it, you cannot move. So uh, the energy-based models, which, are, which represent a probability distribution with an exponential uh, that uh, don't go to zero, so some very small number. So in that sense, energy-based model is appropriate for MCMC. And then we define this uh, general approach to Markov chain Monte Carlo, which was uh, defined by two people, Metropolis and Hastings. And uh, so there is a method for Markov chain Monte Carlo called Metropolis Hastings algorithm. And Gibbs is only a special case of that. And Metropolis Hastings is a very general method and a lot of uh, the literature, statistics and so on talk about uh, using Metropolis Hastings. But in deep learning, uh, the only uh, Metropolis Hastings type of algorithm that is used is Gibbs sampling. So uh, we really don't need a full general formulation, but we'll take a look at it because there is, there is a lot of literature on Metropolis Hastings. And the last part of this Markov chain Monte Carlo is uh, a somewhat of a theoretical justification of uh, why this is, this is the appropriate approach. So I tried to illustrate again, that since the sampling is, a, is an abstract idea, I thought we should really fix our uh, thought on what is the subject really about is that in deep learning, we construct models uh, such as the one shown here. This is, a, this is a very simple deep learning model. It's a, called a restricted Boltzmann machine, which has got some visible units. That's the data you're presenting, and it's got some hidden units, which capture some uh, representation. And uh, we have shown an equation for, uh, not quite equation, a, form, a formulation, x is equal to v, comma, h. If the v is and the h's together is x, it's some set of random variables. And when we say p model of x, it's a probability distribution over this set of variables. And what do we mean by probability distribution? It assigns a probability to get any given set of values of v's and the h's, and the p model gives a probability, or a PDF value, or a probability value. And uh, how do we set that value is based on all those uh, weights uh, that you're connecting up. And we just saw, as soon as you specified these factors or the weights between these variables and, and for clicks, uh, we can say, aha, that can be 
written as a Gibbs distribution with a particular expression which involves uh, uh, a product of all of these factors. And then of course we need the partition function one over Z which sums over all the possible values so that the probability distribution always gives you value one. So irrespective of all the weights you have learned, we are guaranteeing that this is going to be a probability distribution which is going to give you a high value uh, or a low value depending on high probability or low probability. And we use an energy formulation which is going to flip it around uh, in terms of probability to energy. And once we have a model here, once we have learned all the Ws by feeding these Vs to it and, uh, and how do we learn it? There is no supervision here, it's an unsupervised model. We do that by uh, using a maximum likelihood. So we uh, use a maximum likelihood formulation to uh, determine the best parameters to capture the distribution saying that can be done and we talked about uh, how we can set up the uh, likelihood and the derivative of the likelihood, the log likelihood and so on. That's how we learn it. And once we have learned it, we got a model. We have learned how the data is distributed. And supposing we trained it on uh, MNIST handwritten digits. We presented V1, V2, V3, etc. corresponding to the uh, pixels in these images of handwritten digits. It captures a distribution. And then we can say, oh, good. So now that you know what all handwritten digits look like, give me a whole set of samples that, uh, that you know about. And these are not necessarily uh, rote learned. It's not something that you have saved over there. You're gonna be generating these samples using uh, your idea of probabilities, generate some more of the higher probability ones and so on. And so for instance, it could generate these pictures that you see below, these are all handwritten digits generated by an RBM with an appropriate size of the RBM. You need a certain number of visible units and kidney units and so on. But uh, that is the end goal is to generate samples like this. And these have been generated presumably by using Gibbs sampling, saying uh, it can generate you an infinite number of samples because it knows what these look like. And it's, it's going from seven, nine, six, it's moving between the different uh, digits. It's not stuck in one, but uh, it's generating all these. Well, what about, what if we had a, a distribution that was much more complicated than handwritten digits? These are all uh, color images of people's faces and, uh, and there are RGB images in high resolution and so on. So presumably an RBM, a simple design like that won't capture all the fine variations that are possible and we need uh, more degrees of freedom. And one way of doing it is by uh, having a depth or uh, of course we could have had lots of hidden units but that would be almost infinitely large. The better solution is to have a hidden or a deep network. So in this case we have uh, a deep network with uh, three deep layers and uh, I don't know if that is itself enough for all of this but uh, that's the idea and uh, we can now generate samples from this model but it's not much different from the previous one. It's got a bunch of V's and H's and uh, it is a, uh, an undirected graphical model that is capturing the joint distribution. And now when we present a particular value of V, we should be able to uh, give what is its probability. This assigns a probability X, the model assigns a probability X. So when you have a model, you are able to give me the probability for that X, which is kind of nice saying, okay, that's a, this is the associate probability with it. Uh, of course, that's one possible use of it but uh, maybe they're not that interesting. It, it's interesting only from the point of view of uh, our sampling we'll see. P of X is, is a great value for that. But uh, saying, if it says this face has a probability 0 0.0000001, that doesn't tell me a lot because every face is gonna have such a low probability. But the sample itself is gonna be uh, useful for me so the sample would be the values of the V's saying, uh, okay, from your model, which involves H's and V's, uh, generate for me V's uh, and uh, go on producing more and more of these. And uh, of course, uh, it might get stuck in, it might like certain faces and, and just stay there because that's a very common one. Uh, but we want it to give, give, us, give us a good series of samples. So what the faces look like. And what is shown here, uh, I believe, is all synthetic faces. None of them are real. 
So, uh, you know, there is a lot of uh, examples you can see on the internet. Very uh, fine resolution uh, image of somebody's face who just does not exist. Uh, it is able to create uh, just as, as random samples. And so, so that is the idea. So keep in mind, there is such an important practical use for sampling to generate these kinds of samples, either for the sample's sake uh, or for the sake of doing some kind of inference. So that's what we are, we are trying to learn here. Now, again, this is just a recollection. I think uh, when we are learning the material, it doesn't hurt to uh, repeat or reiterate what we have learned already. Every time it's going to be a slightly different context. So uh, revisiting the topic is worthwhile. This slide talks about two types of sampling. Uh, the uh, sampling of, Marco of Bayesian networks first, which is the direct graphical model. And the second part is the sampling from Markov networks. And uh, previously, we, in the previous slides, uh, we talked about uh, undirected models, which is a Markov network. So let's focus our attention on the first part. Uh, we have uh, a diagram here of a Bayesian network. It's got three variables, A, B, and C. Drawing a sample from that distribution, which has variables A, B, and C is pretty straightforward. It simply says, order the samples in some sequence with the ancestors appearing first. So you would say, let's say A, uh, then B, uh, uh, then C. And uh, that's okay because A appears before B and A appears before C. So you would have some ordering like that. And then we generate a sample from A, generate a sample from B given A, generate a sample from C given A and B. And uh, that would give a true sample from the distribution. Now keep in mind, what is a sample from the distribution? It is some setting for the variables A, B, and C. So A might take uh, two values, B might take three values, C might take three values. So we choose among one of those, which is uh, uh, defined by the model. And we can generate more and more samples like that. And these the distributions uh, will make sure that we're covering the ground of uh, what are the more probable samples, which are the less probable samples, because we know the conditional distributions that go into defining the Bayesian network. For a Markov network, things are not so easy, which is why we need these all these complicated material. And Markov networks are what Bayesian network, or what neural networks are seem to be largely about. So we need to learn uh, this. And with Markov networks, uh, such as this one, take a look at this, this Markov network. It's a very simple one, A, B, C, D, uh, connected in this way. And uh, there are these four uh, nodes and there are four clicks, A, B, B, C, C, D, and D, A. So we can de define some factors. And as long as we can define a, a partition function based on the summation, we say, hey, that represents a probability distribution. A may take two values or the four values and B may take whatever number of values. I can use that model to tell you what is the probability distribution and what is the probability associated with every value of A, B, C, and D. Now, supposing I wanted to sample from this, if I say, I, if I tried the approach of Bayesian networks, uh, it's going to fail here. I can't say uh, first sample from A because uh, sampling from A is dependent upon uh, its uh, connections to B and D. And so you have to take into account uh, the dependencies of A to B and D because there is a dependency between these. So only if you know B and D, if you know the values of B and D, then I can sample A. So that is based on the idea of uh, D separation type of separation rules for Markov networks. If you know the connecting variables that, that create what's called as a Markov blanket, so you can generate an A. But only thing is that's uh, after when you know the values of B and D, you can generate A. And similarly to generate from C, you need to know B and D, or to generate B, you need to know A and uh, C and so on. So uh, this says uh, there is some kind of looping going on here that I cannot uh, simply sample from these variables without taking into uh, account the dependencies. Note that in a Bayesian network on top, 
that was not needed because of this particular ordering scheme we had. And uh, the joint probability distribution is given by a product of the conditional probabilities. So that was, uh, that was okay. Whereas here, there's a dependency. And how do you tell the, you need this dependency? One more way to look at it is the probability associated with any setting has a value of Z occurring here in the uh, denominator. And Z is dependent on all of the variables summed together. So this says any setting for any value of A would uh, depend upon the settings for all the other values of B, C, D. And how do you, why do you say that is it's based on this idea of partition function. So we say that this is a chicken and egg problem that to sample from A, B, C, D, you need to so draw samples from A given B, D. And to sample uh, from B, you need uh, A given, uh, B given A, C, and so on. So this problem is avoided by this uh, technique of Markov chains. So there you can motivate it saying, okay, we need something more complicated to sample from variables that are all connected to each other or related to each other. We have to take the uh, relationships into account. So again, the difficulties with plain Monte Carlo are uh, that, uh, or some more, there are some more difficulties with plain Monte Carlo. There is a unconditional, suppose we are interested in unconditional sampling PFX. Unconditional means no settings. Uh, give me values of all the variables. And uh, in, in such a case, it's hard to get rare events in high dimensional spaces. That's another issue with uh, plain Monte Carlo. And we just saw they're infeasible for Markov random fields unless we know the partition function Z. So these are the issues with, uh, uh, with uh, direct sampling and with Markov random fields. And uh, the idea of important sampling doesn't work well if proposal Q of X is very different from P of X. Uh, and uh, if we say, we, you know, we can compute the partition function, can we generate from P of X? Uh, still the PFX cannot be very different from Q of X. And so even constructing a Q of X uh, similar to PFX can be difficult. And so important sampling doesn't carry over to complicated distributions. And the intuition of Markov chain Monte Carlo is that instead of a fixed proposal, Q of X, we use an adaptive proposal. We keep changing. Okay, let's take a look at a very simple example here. Uh, again, addressing the shortcoming of direct sampling. With direct sampling, uh, directly from P model of X, the, the chicken and egg problem, which we just described. And then uh, uh, important sampling with a low variance proposal is difficult. That's when we end up saying we need something more. And let's take a look at this. Let's say the distribution represented by our network is just by model. This black curve here is the model distribution. And uh, we want samples from that distribution. And we're saying, why can't we do that directly? Again, it was a chicken and egg problem that there is so many variables connected to each other that uh, it is uh, infeasible for us to directly generate the sample. So we are now going about saying, let's use this red distribution. It looks, look like, it looks like a simple Gaussian distribution. Uh, we call that as Q of X. And so we could say generate samples from Q of X. All right, uh, Q of X is going to start giving us samples. Maybe it's going to give us one right at its mode, which is uh, the mean. It's going to be the most probable value. It gave us a sample X1. And then we again invoke it Give me another sample, it probably gives us an X2 on this side, and then it gives us an X3 on the other side, and so on. It'll keep on generating samples from Q of X. And, uh, but as you can see, the uh, mode problem is evident here, that these samples are only coming from one mode, uh, and they're not approaching the second mode at all. There is, there's a mode to the right, which is even bigger. And so we would like samples to uh, go across and give us samples from 
every possible face or every possible hundred digit and not just focus on one. And to define this Markov chain Monte Carlo, uh, we invoke uh, the energy based model. So the kind of distribution we have that we need to sample from is an energy based model. And why is that again? Is because MCMC requires no zero probability to any state. But we got this word called state coming in here. A state is an assignment to all the variables in the model, right? So uh, MCMC requires that no state uh, has a zero probability and, uh, and that is guaranteed by an energy based model, which says the probability distribution X is proportional to exponential of minus e to the power of X, uh, e, e, yeah, the, the power of minus EX. And uh, just to recall, what is this notation before we get lost is uh, it's a fairly simple idea. Supposing you had a, you had a, a Markov network here, A, B, C, D, E, F, with the connections shown like that. And we say there are five clicks in this. It implies that uh, the energy model with A, B, C, D, E, F has got five terms to it, E, A, B, E, B, C, E, A, D, E, B, E, 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 F. And together, these are the sum of all of these. And uh, we are saying that has a correspondence to this factor idea that factor of AB is exponential of minus EAB. So we get the idea of a factor between these two and that is based on the energy and there is a negative sign here. So factor uh, is that uh, is in terms of probabilities. Factor is on the right hand side shown here. What is this factor again? The joint probability distribution is given by the unnormalized P hat of X and the P hat of X is a product of factors. And that is, that is the Gibbs distribution formulation where Z, and if we define Z is equal to uh, this quantity, that's how it defines Z, it's a partition function. So this is basic uh, formulation of a probability distribution in terms of the energy model. And by uh, setting uh, phi AB equal to EXP, we get a P of A. So we get the energy of this model. We also get the probability distribution for that model. All right, so uh, the uh, probability distribution is involves the partition function as well as the energies. And the Z of course gets stated in terms of the energies again, as the definition there. Okay, so uh, we are using this formulation to uh, proceed in terms of uh, sampling explanation. So this one is about uh, what is the idea of a Markov chain? So we use what's called as a state diagram. So you have to keep in mind a state diagram is a different kind of thing than either a probabilistic graphical model or a neural network. So there are different types of diagrams. Uh, we've seen so many already. We've seen probabilistic graphical models, which in which case, in which every node is a variable, which can take on several possible values. And uh, uh, so this is, a, this is a different type of diagram where every node is a state and uh, let's say we had, uh, so we have a sequence of random variables, S0, S1, S2. So SI take on D possible values. So the state takes on one of D possible values. So a state could be thought of as an assignment of uh, values to all the variables in the model. So we are then saying, uh, can you tell me what is the probability of going from one set of values to another set of values for the state? And that is what is being uh, captured by this model. So it's the probability of going from one to two is 1.0 or one to, uh, or yeah, that that's the only one. Whereas from two, there's a 0.5 probability going to one and three, and from three is a 1.0 probability going to one. So we, we say this is a state diagram. It's going from one state to the next state. So when we are talking about a Markov chain over three states, and uh, the weighted directed edges indicate probabilities of transitioning to a different state. So, we're, so state is just an assignment of values to all the variables in the model. So that, that would correspond to all the uh, neurons in the neural network. One set of values would be a state and we're talking about the probability from going from there to the next one. So, how do we define going from one state to the next state? We say, well, uh, the Markov chain is defined by a random state X. 
and a transition distribution t of x prime given x. So there's a probability of going from state x to state x prime defined by t. Keep in mind this t, x is not just one variable. It's a vector of all the variables. However, we define it could be all the variables v and h for instance. So running a Markov chain means repeatedly updating the state x to value x prime sample from t x prime given x. So this says you would start out with some state and running a Markov chain means uh, you are transitioning the distribution. And that's where the idea comes in of an adaptive distribution. We are saying we are getting samples from this conditional distribution now, which is uh, previously there was you were in a certain state and you move to another state when you are sampling from that. All right, we just saw this example. Uh, and keeping this in mind, uh, the model is an undirected model. State is an instance of values assigned to all the variables. And our goal is to obtain samples from the trained model. We assume that we know all the Ws. And we assume that for any X, we are able to compute P of X. Uh, one more thing we are assuming here is, uh, if I give you some uh, value X, you have a model, right? So that assigns a particular probability to that. So this, that is a, that's a concept that is going to be needed in generating these samples. And that's a fair assumption because you know all the values associated with it. You will have to just plug it in into Gibbs uh, formulation. You would need the Z. Uh, that's another whole chapter in deep learning, by the way. The next chapter after we finish Monte Carlo sampling is called uh, confronting the partition function. And there we say, well, if Z is so difficult, uh, how, what are you going to do? Right now, we're going to be assuming that Z is uh, manageable. So we are able to compute PFX, which requires a Z. There we will look at, well, okay, what are you going to do about that? That's where we define the contrastive divergence algorithm that Jeffrey Hinton defined uh, for the restricted Boltzmann machine. So that's, that's the next chapter. For now, we'll assume that we are able to compute PFX. Okay, now let's run this example, I think is helpful to understand a concept. Now, uh, this diagram on the left is uh, what is wrong with importance sampling? We already saw that. The red uh, distribution is the proposal distribution. And uh, we, uh, we are just sampling from one red distribution, which is not going to be such a good representation for all of PFX. Uh, for instance, we, we need to generate the weights, right, for important sampling. And uh, the weight will take the ratio of PFX and QFX. And uh, it will be pretty much zero for PFX all over here. Because, uh, and they're going to be, uh, the true distribution has all these values and it's going to be not a very good uh, proposal Q. What MCMC or Markov chain Monte Carlo says, you keep changing the distribution. So you can see that there is a red distribution followed by a green distribution followed by a blue distribution. So this is changing the distribution and says, well, you generate sample X1 from this distribution and uh, you uh, go and generate uh, X2 moving onwards and then uh, moving onwards you generate uh, NX3. And how do we move it is the, is the main question. So we're going to be generating these distributions of the first one, we'd have uh, some sample X1, and then we uh, generate samples from X2 given X1, right? And then we generate samples from X3 given X2, and then generate samples of X4 given X3. So we are kind of conditioning upon the previous sample. You have seen a sample, and given that sample, uh, can you generate a sample for me from a Q of the random variable given that the previous one was this? So that is, uh, how we're going to be moving it along. And so the samples that you're going to be deriving it are going to be moving along. And hopefully they're better samples. They're not stuck in one red area here, but they're all over the place here. And the, the way we move it is going to depend on uh, the probability assignments you're going to get for those samples. So the idea of MCMC is uh, construct a Markov chain whose states will be assignments to the variables in the model and whose stationary distribution will uh, will equal the model probability, okay? 
So Metropolis uh, Hastings uh, came up with this idea and the user to specify a transition kernel Q X prime X and acceptance probability A X prime given X. So this says draw a sample X prime from Q X prime given X where X is the previous sample and the new sample is accepted or rejected uh, with probability A F X prime given X. So that is defined as A F X prime given X is the min of one comma P F X prime times Q F X given X prime divided by P F X and Q F X prime given X. It encourages us to move towards more likely points in the distribution. So we have to compute a probability uh, A and uh, use that A whether to remain there or to, or to move along. So AX, what is this AX prime X is the ratio of important sampling weights. Ah, that we know, we saw what is important sampling weights. And that is saying the numerator is the importance weight for X prime and the denominator is the importance weight for X. And we divide the importance weight for X prime by that of X. And uh, we need to compute uh, only a ratio rather than PX prime or PX separately. Uh, that is useful because uh, the computation of PFX may involve the partition function Z and it says once you do the ratio, I suppose you can get rid of that, ensures that after sufficient draw, samples will come from the true distribution PFX. Right? So this is a very clever idea that Metropolis and Hastings came up with. And so let's work through Metropolis Hastings for that simple example. Uh, let Q of X prime given X be a Gaussian centered on X. So this is uh, 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 given a particular sample X naught. So we have a, a conditional distribution X prime given X. So uh, initialize X naught. That's what we're doing. The first step is initialize some value. And uh, we now draw a sample from that distribution uh, X1 given X0 and it could be any value that falls under this red distribution here. It says, let's say the sample came out here and on the wrong side, but it's quite possible because we're just assuming we have a Gaussian. Um, and uh, we draw that and we accept that particular X1 uh, because it uh, uh, had a, a reasonable value for the acceptance probability. So the X1 seems fine because the two probabilities are not too bad here, the black one and the red one. So it says, okay, that's a reasonable sample. And uh, we uh, draw another X2 here. And that is also being accepted because uh, the red probability and the black probability are reasonable values. And so, uh, uh, it, so we say, okay, we got X, uh, X naught we started out with and we are getting X1 and X2. Uh, and uh, then we went on to uh, generate a sample uh, from that, except X2, but um, we again draw uh, and uh, we draw a sample. In this case, uh, we are drawing a sample X prime over here uh, which gets uh, rejected because we have a low value for black over here and that gets rejected and we set uh, x3 is equal to x2. We reject it because P of x prime given x2 is very small, that ratio. Hence A of x prime given x2 is close to zero and so that gets rejected. So, uh, and we set uh, X3 to X2. So we are at the same, same place as, as we were earlier on. So this is the idea of the rejection is uh, we are getting a low value for the acceptance probability. And we again draw another sample from this proposal distribution. And uh, we are now drawing uh, X4 and we are getting a pretty good probability for P. Uh, keep in mind that we are interested in sampling from P. And so P is getting a good value for uh, X4 because that's in the nice black region here. Uh, and so we accept that. And, uh, and so the adaptive proposal now is this conditional distribution. We're kind of moving that along and uh, it's a conditional distribution of Q3 given, uh, uh, Q of X3 given X2. 
and we draw it. And now again, we draw an X5, and uh, and that's also a good sample. And so on. I guess that's that's the end of the story. All right. So this story is a bit like a movie. It is uh, saying uh, you start with a distribution, generate a sample, and then if it is good, you accept it, and we draw from the conditional distribution given that, and so on, and we accept or reject based on a criterion of importance uh, ratio of weights, and we move on to the next one. So we're kind of running along. Uh, and generating samples, and we want to be generating to represent the entire distribution. That's the goal. We don't want to be stuck with giving us, you know, uninteresting samples. Okay, the next few slides here. Uh, I'm just wondering whether we want to go over all of it, but let me let me just skim through it fast. Theoretical uh, uh, justification of MCMC. And uh, this is uh, useful. And the reason to even look at it is uh, if, if sampling is such an important topic and if uh, Gibbs sampling is so important, uh, don't you want to understand how that works? Of course, uh, everybody who's designing a deep learning system will just say, uh, you know, just call the Gibbs sampling, uh, uh, you know, library function. But this is all what goes into it. So what are we doing here? Reparameterize the problem. Assume X has countably many states. Supposing X has countable number of states, and we're talking about run infinitely many Markov chains in parallel. Uh, and so we are saying, supposing we uh, have uh, different starting states and we keep producing uh, chains, and, uh, and uh, we are uh, generating uh, a distribution uh, Q at time T, uh, the distribution we generate should converge uh, 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 to P of X. So in the sense, the uh, distribution, the conditional distribution uh, is going along with, with uh, P of X. And so updating the Markov chain uh, state, the probability of a single state uh, landing in X prime is given by QT plus one is given by QT and then there is a transition probabilities and so on, all right? So this is uh, going into these arguments. It says uh, using uh, a, some kind of a eigenvalue uh, equation, we can uh, say that uh, the uh, uh, update can be written in terms of V and A. What is this uh, definition? Somewhere along the way, we have uh, uh, v and A are, are being defined, and uh, so that is how we are stating it. All right. So this is a, uh, a an eigenvalue equation that involves uh, V's here and A's that uh, come from the definition of the problem here earlier on. Uh, yeah, this is <laughs> V was defined over here. You can describe Q using a vector V with Q of X equal to I is equal to V sub I. So this is a V for value here. It is not the visible, but V for value. And uh, the transition matrices here, uh, AIJ is defined in terms of uh, as we move from the states. And so that's what this uh, AIJ is. So this is how this whole sequence. And it talks about converging to a, a equilibrium situation and uh, so this is a, a kind of a background so that what we are generating here are uh, uh, converging towards the true distribution that's what is being shown here so that the markov chain idea is a good one so this is all the theoretical justification needed it's a little bit complex involving eigenvector equations uh, this slide is just an interesting aside that uh, what about continuous situations in a in a Markov chain we talk about states transitioning from one to two to three we saw a diagram so they're all discrete what about continuous case uh, where we have changes happening of the transition from one state to the other it's a continuous distribution and uh, people have defined uh, uh, Markov chains for continuous case also and instead of calling it as a Markov chain, they call it as a Harris chain. So it sounds like a, an area of great interest to uh, you know, theoretically interested folks, but uh, it might be of great value if, if you're working with speech, for example, 
we are talking about states changing in a continuous way. So we need a definition of these things. So we'll just leave it at that. That saying Markov chain is also a version in continuous case, which is called Harris chain. And uh, choice of transition distribution. So the discussion of uh, defining uh, the Markov chain Monte Carlo referred to a transition of going from one state to the next state using a transition probability distribution P. And how do you choose that? Uh, and it turns out Gibbs sampling is precisely one way of defining that T. So the distribution that you get from one state to the next state is going to be defined by a conditional distribution. Given the previous set of values, except for one variable, we draw from that conditional distribution to get that value. So there's a particular case of, uh, uh, of, of this. Okay, so this is uh, this part, and uh, we will be going on to a next set of slides. I think we have a little bit of time, and there's not that much time I need to spend on it, I think. And uh, so let me go back to new share here, and uh, we are going to be doing uh, Gibbs sampling. Okay, good. Okay, so this is the special case of uh, Gibbs sampling and we've seen it uh, a couple of times before, but we just want to uh, look at it again because how does this fit in? We just learned about Markov chain Monte Carlo as a way of generating samples by changing the proposal distribution as we move along and we need a, a way of changing the distribution and Gibbs tells you how to do that. Okay, okay that's what Gibbs sampling is about. All right, the conceptually simplest approach for drawing samples from an undirected graph is a Gibbs sample. So uh, supposing we have a graphical model over a, a d-dimensional vector of random variables x and we iteratively visit each variable xi and draw sample condition and all the other variables. So if you have a way of generating one variable given all the others, um, so we can, uh, we, you know, we can get a sample. Of course, we got to run through all the variables before you get one sample. Right? A state is defined by values for all the variables. Due to the separation properties of the graphical model, we can condition only on the neighbors of Xi. So the question here is, if you're going to be dealing with a neural network with so many variables, how are you going to be able to generate one value conditioned upon all the millions of others you have? This says, don't worry, that uh, we can use the separation property, the de-separation property, of uh, undirected models and say we can condition only on the neighbors. So you can only look at the neighbors of it and say given those values, you can generate. So we, we start with some setting where we given all the values. Oh, great, we know all the values. So uh, you just say, give, get me one variable given all the neighbors. Since you know all that, you can just generate from that conditional. So Gibbs sampling is an MCMC that samples every random variable for PGM or probability graphic model one at a time. So Gibbs sampling is a special case of Metropolis Harris. And the advantages of it is uh, fairly easy to derive for many graphical models, mixture models, date in Dirichlet allocation, you name it, all the famous machine learning methods, including some of the more recent GANs and so on, they all use uh, this idea. They have reasonable computation and memory requirements since the sample only one random variable at a time. And the last point is an interesting one. It says it can be a raw blackwellized. Um, some of you may know about raw, right? In India, you know, he's one of the most famous uh, scientists that India has produced, uh, Professor C. R. Rao. Uh, he uh, was a statistician at the Indian Statistical Institute. Um, right now, he's close to 100 years old, and he lives in Buffalo, New York, where I live. He's in the same place now, uh, where, he, where he lives with his daughter. Uh, C.R. Rao has a number of important theorems in statistics 
and uh, of course the rao crame inequality you might have heard there is another one called uh, the rao blackwell theorem and uh, that turns out to have a, an important uh, bearing on sampling and what is called as particle based inference or you're doing inference uh, based on samples but not ordinary samples these are called particles a particle is an interesting concept in statistics it says if you have a number of variables a particle is uh, if i know some of the uh, uh, variables uh, you and you are assigning values to the other variables uh, then uh, jointly you are getting all that set and that is referred to as a particle that is a whole set of values together so in that sense it becomes more than a single point so when you say all of these are fixed uh, and you are you are assigning values to a whole set of variables you are now defining not just a point but a whole region which is like a particle so in so in this case uh, supposing some variables can be integrated out right? that's what we do in marginalization right when we say marginal out the other variables uh, then uh, and we give a sample uh, for uh, one of these variables that represents uh, a whole set of assignments to all the other possibilities so it becomes a sample so all it's saying is uh, if you uh, you can integrate out some of the variables and it is referred to as collapsed gibbs sampling that you are getting a gibbs sample uh, for uh, a set of values uh, for some of the variables that uh, have been integrated out okay so we saw what the gibbs sampling algorithm is is uh, supposing it contains variables x1 through xn we initialize starting value and do until convergence we sample from xi given all the other variables except of xi and then from the uh, that's from the conditional you get a sample and we update the xi th variable and we keep on doing for all the variables we run through all the n variables and by the time we are done we have one sample in the gibbs sampling algorithm i've shown this slide before the same thing and this one uh, talks about uh, the conditional p of xi through xn without i looks uh, intimidating but uh, we are using markov blanket idea that uh, it is uh, ignoring all the other variables except the set around it which is referred to as the blanket of that particular node so this conditional xi given all of these is the same as xi given the markov blanket of xi which is all the variables that it is connected to so relating gibbs back to metropolis hastings gibbs sampling is a special case of metropolis hastings with proposal q of xi prime x x not i given xi and x not i is given by xi prime given x not i so this is a particular way of specifying the q which we uh, use in the in the definition of the transition uh, matrix so we can argue here that it is just a special case and there is a variant of this called uh, uh block gibbs sampling which says uh, in the particular structure such as a restricted boltzmann machine we can simultaneously sample running through every node one at a time seems like a laborious process if you're talking about a million uh, variables but it says it's not so bad for certain structures for a restricted boltzmann machine may be sampled simultaneously because they are all conditionally independent given all the hidden units uh like all the hidden units may be sampled simultaneously because they are all conditionally independent given all the visible units so simultaneously it's possible to get values of v and h and so on because of some independence properties that hold which you which you learn from um the discussion on probabilistic graphical models this one says prevalence of gibbs sampling it says uh there are uh, alternate markov chain monte carlo approaches to sample from a model uh, mark uh, metropolis hastings is widely used in other disciplines so you might encounter uh, in some other uh, applications they are using metropolis hastings but for uh, the field of deep learning and uh, capturing probability distributions using undirected models it is rare to use any approach other than gibbs uh 
And uh, the last bullet point here says, improved sampling techniques is a research frontier. Ha. Huh. So, I mean, right now you recall, uh, we are studying uh, research topics in uh, deep learning. And uh, this uh, part is about, uh, is about, uh, um, you know, research uh, in uh, in sampling. Okay, so there is one more uh, set of slides. Rather than postponing it to the next time, and it's a quite a substantial section. Let me take just five minutes to uh, uh, tell you what what this one is about: the challenge of mixing. Okay, I hope you can see this. This one says challenge of mixing between separated modes, all right? And uh, this one is about a problem that occurs with uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. See, the stories here are endless. We went from uh, important sampling, I mean, first of all, we went from Y sampling, and then we went to important sampling, and then it says, oh, that's not good enough. Let's go to, you know, uh, Metropolis Hastings sampling, and then we say a version of it is called Gibbs sampling. And now we are saying that there is a challenge of mixing between separated modes. And this is the issue I already hinted at earlier on, which is saying uh, you might end up getting samples from only of a certain kind. All right. So the topic here is the challenge of mixing and uh, tempering to mix, mix between modes and that depth may help mixing. So the challenge of mixing. So what is this about mixing? Okay, let me put this into a uh, uh, slide uh, show. Uh, challenge of mixing between separate modes. So challenge of mixing. The ideal samples would be independent. So we are, if you say we want samples from a probability distribution, they would be, each of them would be independent of the other. You don't want them to kind of stick to each other. So it says uh, visit regions in X space proportional to the probability. Go through all of the state space of all the values that your uh, network can take and uh, give me samples proportional to probability. High probability ones come more often. Instead, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo samples become very correlated and this is referred to as slow mixing. We want it to mix. This idea comes from mixture models, right? Mixture model is about having uh, you know, um, multimodal Gaussians, right? The mixture of Gaussians. And, uh, and it is slowly moving from one to the other. So that's why we're calling it a slow mixing. And uh, it says primary difficulty with the Markov chain Monte Carlo methods is a tendency to mix poorly. And, uh, and this is a bit of arguments as to what happens here. Uh, slow mixing in MCMC resembles noisy gradient descent on energy or noisy hill climbing on probability. Remember that energy and probability are inverse of each other. And uh, a chain takes small steps in its state space. So it's just like in gradient descent, we, we are taking steps towards the uh, uh, minimum. Uh, here also we are taking small steps in its state space uh, preferring lower energy, so we are saying, or higher probability. So we are, that is what is happening. And uh, so there's a random uh, behavior here. If an improbable, like if in an improbable configuration, uh, there is low probability, it moves to a higher probability or a lower energy. Once chain is in region of low energy, this is like high probability uh, region, which can also be thought of as you're on a manifold of images, the same object. Uh, the chain random walks around that model. So this way of generating these samples is just running around the same mode. Occasionally it steps out of that mode because of some variable and generally returns to it or it finds an escape route towards another mode Due to rare escape route, samples uh, same mod longer than it should. It's like a like a little creature running from one to the next, and it's kind of uh, preferring some. So, in the case of uh, Gibbs sample, probability of going from one mode to a near mode within a given number of steps, 
and uh, what will determine that probability is the shape of the energy barrier between the moles. Oh, we are now explaining it in terms of the energy. And transitions between two modes that are separated by a high energy barrier are exponentially less uh, in terms of the height of the energy barrier. So we can have this nice analogy of uh, physics, right? We're talking about energy barrier of moving, same thing. And it is all being illustrated with Gibbs sampling of uh, Gaussian distribution. If it is a nice multivariate normal in distribution with independent variables, Gibbs sampling is running around like this, giving you a sample based on where it was. It's all the next sample is quite nearby. It doesn't jump all over the place. So it's kind of moving around, moving around, moving around. If it is a nice Gaussian, it, it gets you all of that uncorrelated uh, features. But if it is a multivariate normal with correlated variables, uh, it is again focusing around the mean and it again, it's not so good. The mixing is a little bit poor, but the mixing is really poor if I, if I tried it with a multimodal where we have uh, two Gaussians, a mixture of two Gaussians, GMM with widely separated modes, not axis aligned, mixes very slowly. And uh, so this kind of illustrates, and if you have like you know, two types of faces or two types of handwritten digits that are quite different, it might not visit uh, one of them at all. So problem arises when multiple modes of high probability are separated by regions of low probability. Right, so especially when uh, Gibbs sampling uh, updates only a small subset of variables. And there is some simple example that is worked out in terms of conditional distributions here. And here is an example of uh, slow mixing with, uh, with uh, consecutive Gibbs sample and consecutive ancestral samples from again. Uh, these are like uh, samples going uh, left to right and top to bottom. These are the samples coming out hundred and digits from, from an RBM that has been uh, drained. Uh, I don't know if it's, oh yeah, the deep Boltzmann, not on RBM. Uh, several Boltzmann stacked on each other. So it is generating samples like that. It's kind of remaining near the modes and, and so on. And uh, it says consecutive samples are similar to each other, a lot of correlation, because the Gibbs sampling is performed in a, a deep graphical model this similarity is based more on semantic rather than raw visual features. You, you know, uh, we, we can't simply look at it and say, well, you know, how is this one sim similar to this? It's not based on pixels, but some higher level concept, maybe like the human eye would have higher level concepts. But it is still difficult for the Gibbs chain to transition from one mode of distribution to the other. Example, by changing the digit identity. So it's kind of sticking to once for a long time and so on. So it's slow mixing, we say. Whereas uh, GAN is a, another uh, undirected uh, model uh, where we are learning a probability distribution, generative adversarial network. And there we can define a, a directed graphical model and we can use ancestral samplings. And because ancestral sampling generates each sample independently from others, there is no mixing problem. So we're getting some nice, uh, Differences six to three to one to three to seven, so on. Nice samples are, are coming from all over rather than uh, going around slowly. So, uh, this is, I think, one of the advantages of some of these new uh, generative adversarial networks, uh, which uh, don't have some problems of some of these uh, uh, earlier models. And there are some practical scenarios being talked about, and block sampling is of limited use and the consideration and then there's some information theoretic discussions of uh, what kind of things have to these distributions have to satisfy in terms of entropy and mutual information and so on and there are nice solutions here about tempering to mix between modes are there methods for trying to uh, cover the modes properly and then uh, back to deep learning it says depth may help mixing and uh, if you have a deep representation that seems to help in mixing better, which is yet another argument why deep learning is good. And so we conclude the chapter 17 with a conclusion on Monte Carlo, saying despite mixing difficulty, so we said there are some difficulties, but we're saying uh, Monte Carlo techniques are useful and are often the best tool available. So worthwhile, 
to be on top of uh, sampling and uh, the best tool available for inference problems, generating you know exciting looking outputs. They are the primary tool to confront the in intractable partition function of undirected models discussed next. The next chapter, which I believe chapter 18, is titled uh, Confronting the Partition Function. In the discussion that we just had, both on important sampling and Markov chain Monte Carlo, there was an assumption that uh, given any x, you can generate p of x because uh, we, we, we need to use that to compute the weight. Uh, we uh, need to uh, use that to, uh, uh, to compute uh, z for the, uh, uh, for the conditional distributions in Gibbs. So how are we going to deal with that, which is what chapter 18 is all about. A whole chapter devoted to, to computing the intractable partition function z. All right, I'm going to stop there. Uh, are there any questions uh, about the material? And after that, I can uh, take up any other uh, administrative questions you have. Sir, right. is there any difference? No. Pardon me? Yeah. Is there any difference for this topic, sir? Means other than good say no. Oh, oh, you know, sampling is such a big topic. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of uh, material and uh, you know I teach it in some other version in the introduction to machine learning course also I have a bunch of material there this is the deep learning version of sampling <laughs> I've got it two different versions of sampling one for deep learning and for simple machine learning but uh, every textbook on machine learning is you know like st starting from Chris Bishop's book uh, uh, you will have a whole chapter. Cripps Bishop's book here, from what I recall, has a full chapter on sampling. But the treatment kind of is not that useful. Uh, it becomes a, an encyclopedia of uh, this and this and this. There are like a dozen different sampling methods and you get confused saying, wow, do I have to learn all of this stuff or is there something that I need to focus on, which is the one that is most useful. So this deep learning exercise is telling you focus on important sampling, focus on Gibbs sampling. And with that knowledge, you can go back now and say, okay, uh, that's what I want to know. Don't tell me about every single method and ask Chris Bishop or his book and saying, okay, now explain to me again, now that I know what I want to learn. Like that, there's material there or any of the machine learning books will have a whole section chapter. I think there would be even books on on machine on sampling, yeah. right? In, yeah. some, in, in some of slides, uh, you are showing some diagrams, right? MH1, MH2. Yeah, those are not available in Bishop and this good fellow. Oh, yeah. You know what I do is, uh, you, 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 you mean that little uh, video <laughs> type of example going from one to the next to the next yeah. right, names. Yes, 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 well, yes. you know, uh, you uh, may want to search around. That's what I do also. And uh, I try and give the reference. I think I should add that reference there. I think I found it in a, in a paper of uh, some, some form. And uh, I try to bring that in. What happens is, uh, I know I study these books myself. And then you say, wow, this is not clear. So how can I uh, uh, can uh, do better? So I find something and then I try and give an interpretation of that and, and put that in. So yeah, it's not in, uh, in any of the books, right? But it is there somewhere on the web. And uh, you know, sometimes I, I forget to put that in. I think I might have done that lecture yesterday and I need to add that, okay? Yeah. All right, any other uh, question? Okay, so I'm going to uh, turn uh, uh, the recording off and so that in case you want to talk about any other administrative issues, uh, we can do that.